of a church in Minnesota that tried that last year. Split the church down the middle. And if the church won't do it, then do it for the church. Another reaction is to dig in with the rules we already have and become more openly critical and strident in your denunciation of anybody who does it differently. Or you can even decide, maybe this is not the right church. Maybe we've got to leave this because it's become bad one. That's what's happening around the world. Many even of those who don't leave the church feel that the church will not be blessed and will not receive God's power until its members reform and get their behavior to conform to the standard. Is that what Jesus is calling for here in Matthew chapter 5? Is that what he means when he says your righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees? The truth is, I don't think so. However, I do think we need to let these verses bother us. Jesus is calling us to a higher righteousness than maybe even the strictest of us have imagined. What can be higher than getting our behavior in line with the law? Well, what about getting our hearts in line with God's love? Jesus said in Matthew 22, verse 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin. How big are the little pieces of cumin? Little tiny seeds, right? And dill seeds. And you have neglected, Jesus said, the weightier matters. Tithing is not a, not a, not a non-important thing, but Jesus says there are much weightier things. What are they? Justice, mercy, faithfulness. These are the things you should have done without neglecting the other. See, the Pharisees were trying to work from the outside in. Here's how Jesus described it. Matthew 22, verse 25. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of robbery and self-indulgence. You see, they thought that if you kept the outward behaviors good for a long enough time, it would change the heart. Righteousness would become a habit, and people would be good because they were in the habit of being good. Their problem with that, at least Jesus' problem with that, was an old familiar one. They didn't realize the extent of evil in the heart itself. They forgot that pride and selfishness are prime movers in people's lives. And taking pride in one's good works was considered by them to be perfectly good and proper. Isn't it better than being proud of your sins? Well, so if you sacrificed for the temple, it was perfectly acceptable to let everybody know how much you were sacrificing. It would be a good example for people. And that's the way we raise money still to this day in many places. We first get people who are going to give a big amount. And then we go to the rest of the people and say, look, we've got all this money. Won't you come and help us? Or, you know, your political party, we'll give you, you get $10, we'll give, we'll match that 800%. If you're going to pray an exceptionally fine prayer, it was good to have someone blow the trumpet first so that everybody would stop to listen and learn how a good prayer should sound. And I say, listen to your prayer, which would be a recital of all the good things you have done. We would be inspired to be like you. In other words, since pride and selfishness and jealousy do exist, let's use them as advertising to the advancement of the kingdom. By the way, that has not totally disappeared, has it? Or are we more subtle about it? But there is still a temptation to use the church as an avenue to show off. To show off our wealth, to show off our piety, to show off our cultural attainments. But the righteousness that Jesus is talking about starts with a new heart. The righteousness that Jesus says we must have surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees because it works from the inside out. When the righteousness of Jesus is in the heart, Different things are important. What you wear is not as important as why you wear it. What you do is not as important as why you do it. God has given a certain good
good reasons why certain things should not be found in the life of a Christian. They work against our life in Christ. But the answer is not to concentrate on those things. Hebrews 12 says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down in the right hand of the throne of God, fixing our eyes on Jesus. If only we would keep Jesus centermost in our thoughts and affections. The problem with the Pharisees was that they loved the law instead of loving God. The old Scottish preacher, poet, and novelist George MacDonald tells in a book called The Shopkeeper's Daughter of a lady who had great patience and courage. But, George MacDonald says, her belief in religion rather than in God made her very strict in her observances. And she thought a great deal more about the Sabbath than of man, more of the Bible than of truth, and 10 times more about her creed than about God's will. A Pharisee in modern clothes. Are we more concerned with obedience than we are with being God's personal friend? Remember, it's not who you know. It's not, I mean, sorry, it's not what you know that will save you. It is who you know. Many great theologians who knew not their savior will be lost. And many humble Christians who knew very little doctrine but were friends with Jesus will be saved. The pastor, aren't you getting away from the text? Doesn't it say that the righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees? It's all very well to talk about being friends with Jesus. But let's get back to the serious stuff about getting our lives in order. We got a long way to go and not very much time left to get there. But don't you see? The scribes and Pharisees are exhibit A, that you will never get there if you concentrate on right doing. Rather, concentrate on being God's friend, and the righteousness will take care of itself. Concentrate on that, because after all, what is the real definition of, of righteousness? Is it obedience to God's law? Yeah, maybe. That's a one reference. But what is God's law? Jesus said, well, let's repeat what Jesus said. You know the Shema? Let's repeat it. I'll say a phrase, and you repeat it back, okay? Listen, royal children of God. Listen, royal children of God. Yahweh is your God. Yahweh is, God. Yahweh is the one and only God. Yahweh, the one and only God. Now we get to the stuff. What do we do about it? You shall love Yahweh your God. You shall love Yahweh your God. With all your heart. With all your heart. With all your soul. With all your soul. With all your strength. With all your strength. With all your mind. With all your mind. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. As yourself. As yourself. So real perfection is allowing God's love to so fill us with everything we do and say so that all of those things come from a motivation to, to love God. Because God is so precious to us, we don't want anything to do, to do anything to displease him. And filled with his love, we have a servant's heart. We're willing to spend and be spent for our neighbors. So how do you fall in love? You know, when I was in high school, that was a big concern among us high school students. How are we going to fall in love? How will we know it when we fall in love? Uh, well, uh, one summer I was at junior camp. Hey, kids, I was at junior camp one summer. I was a counselor, and I had a lot of fun with the kids, except some of the kids were disobedient. But anyway, when the kids went to sleep, especially toward the end of the summer, a bunch of us high school seniors we were, had been, we were now going to go off to college, we would get together and have long discussions on the meaning of love. We would quote G Khalil Gibran. Anybody ever heard of him? A poet? Oh, wonderful stuff he said about love. And we tried to understand his deep thoughts on the subject. 
now we were experts on love, right? Mm -hmm. No, only in dissecting its dead carcass. Mm -hmm. A few months later, I met Leslie, mm -hmm. and I fell in love. Mm -hmm. And I threw away a Cleo Jabbar. Uh -huh. That's the first body of the case of love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true, but it was better than the books. <laughs> or Eric Fromm. No relation to Eric Heiser. <laughs> Being in love was so much more, and it was such a vast new world, I no longer felt I had any knowledge to express or expound upon. And so it is with Jesus. Knowing Jesus is so much more than any of all of our theological attempts to analyze can ever capture. At best, we can say, it's a little bit like this, but it's also so much more. So my question for you today is really very simple. Is Jesus your friend? He really wants to be your friend. Are you willing to be his friend? I did not ask, do you believe the doctrines? Are you going to be obedient? I'm simply asking, is Jesus your friend? Those other things are important, maybe in third or fourth place. Is Jesus your friend? Are you listening to the Holy Spirit? Maybe those are the first two. If he is your friend, then you have, then you have. I don't say you're about to get, or you might get. I say, if Jesus is your friend, you have the better righteousness. Because Jesus is the better righteousness. If he is not your friend, there is nothing you can substitute for the flack that you have. You do not have righteousness. There's only one person who has righteousness. It's Jesus. If, you're, if, you're, if he's not your friend, you're missing out on what life was meant to be. God made you for one purpose. He made you so that he could love you and so that you could love him back. If life seems meaningless to you without Jesus, it is no wonder. His love is the only meaning for life. Well, you ask, well, then how do I become Jesus' friend? Well, you don't have to go to Jerusalem or spend weeks in prayer to find him. Prayer is a good thing. But he, even right now, he is knocking at the door of your heart. Simply invite him into your life. Of course, if you want your friendship to grow, if you want him to become your best friend, then what we talked about in Sabbath school is important. Spending time with Jesus. Tell him your hopes, your fears, your ambitions, your likes, your dislikes, your weaknesses, your strengths. That's what you do with friends, really good friends. Like any good friend, he loves to talk with you about the things that, that bother you, the things that concern you. Like any good friend, he's concerned about the big things like eternity and jobs and family, as well as the little things like what should I wear today or what should I say to so-and-so or what should I, how do I, how do I, why do I feel good or why do I feel bad? Talk to him, talk to him, listen to him, read his word, not to find some new point you can use in a debate, but just to listen to him talk to you so that you sense his love and sense what he's like. Listen while he talks to Jeremiah. Wow. You can read Jeremiah without crying, then you haven't even noticed what you're reading. Because Jeremiah is crying through it all. Learn about it. So when you boil down everything we do at church, it all boils down to this. Everything we do, or should do, is to help each other get to know Jesus. Some of us are new friends with Jesus. We're just learning what he likes and dislikes. We love him, but we don't always know how to show it. Others have known him longer, and it shows. Well, how does it show? Well, it shows if they are more generous, more patient, less critical, kinder, gentler, they have more self-control. They trust Jesus enough that they can be at peace even when trouble's all around them. They know how to encourage without nagging. They know how to point out a problem without discouraging. They can serve without making a show of their service. They can love quietly, sometimes without saying a word. The fact that there are struggling people in church doesn't discourage Jesus at all. Not at all. Rather, it makes Jesus and the Father rejoice. Here are some new friends who are just learning about him. No matter how well or how poorly you reflect Jesus now, he has promised that if you walk with him, you will become like him. So which way do you want to go? 
you want to try, try to beat the scribes and Pharisees at their game of trying to get your behavior and everybody else's in line with whatever you think is in line? Or do you want to be a friend of Jesus? Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, and I, as I also overcame, and am sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. By the way, that last verse, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, I think that's a poor translation. Because we think of church as a group of people who love Jesus. That's okay. But the word church in Greek actually means something different. It's a different word. It means elected, or even better, chosen. So we could translate it this way. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the ones I have chosen. The problem with sin is not the bad sins that we do. The problem with sin is that it fills us with shame, and then we run away and hide from God's love. Jesus was tempted to separate from his father, to build his own righteousness. But he knew his father. He loved his father more than everything else. And that love was to him more than life itself. Until we see God that way, we really haven't yet seen him in his fullness. God wants to pour out his love on you. He wants to pour out his blessings upon you. He loves to give you gifts. We love to give gifts to the ones we love, right? And when you spend time with him, you will fall in love with him. Like he loved his father. You will share a love that is eternal. You're not saved by being like him. Though if you are his friend, you will become more like him. Just the way friends work. You're saved by living in his love. For in the end, the better righteousness Jesus was talking about is Jesus and the Father, and the Spirit. God is the only righteous one in this world. We are righteous only if we trust in his righteousness. And that is an entirely different kind of righteousness than anything a scribe or Pharisee had imagined up to that point. And it's a different kind of righteousness than the best legalist in the world can imagine. And so when he knocks at your door and wants to spend a lifetime with you, open the door. Let him come into your heart. Will you do that? Now, something happened this morning. And um, we were reading from Morris Benden's devotional book. It came out in, what, 1982 or something like that. And as I read that, I thought, oh, I've got to share it. So it's called It Takes Time. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not be Take time. Jesus' analogy is that the physical life and the spiritual life are sustained in the same way. We're going to sustain our physical life pretty quick now. On three minutes. Or at least I'll be done. And from this we learn basic principles of how to have a meaningful relationship with God. How fat would some of us be if we spend as much time eating our physical food as we spend alone with God? That was the point of the Sabbath school lesson, right? Desire of Ages says it would be well to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. That doesn't mean you have to set a timer to make sure you spend exactly 60 minutes but it's going to have to involve something more than reading a text as your hands on the door, doorknob getting ready to run out of the house, right? You say, I don't have time. May I remind you that we find time for whatever we believe is important. The reason why many people do not spend time in a relationship with Christ every day is simply they don't believe that it's all that important. If they did, they would find the time. If I don't think it's important to spend the time to become acquainted with Christ, it must be because I think I can be saved in some other way other than knowing Jesus. And if I don't, if I, if I don't depend on Jesus, 
or if somebody doesn't depend on tables, they're probably depending on what? Themselves. One of the major reasons people don't spend time in beholding Christ and in relationship with him is that they're still operating on the basis of trying to secure salvation by their own efforts. Now, it's true. You can turn devotional life into a work. Spending time each day reading your Bible and praying will no more guarantee you a healthy spiritual life than daily eating and breathing will assure you a healthy physical life. But it's a sure thing you can't be healthy without eating and breathing, right? <laughs> Jesus said, this is life eternal. What is it? That you might know, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. That's where life eternal is. Knowing God is what life eternal is about. And it's the purpose of a devotional life. You get to know him better than now. The truth is, I've been married for 53 years, I think it is. And I still don't know this lady as well as I wish I could. Because that's the way love is, right? There's always more to find out. One of the saddest songs I heard is from the musical called Chess. And in that song, she says, I have no more mysteries. I have there's nothing else. He knows me all the way through. And therefore, they were about to break up. You'll never know God that well. You'll never know the end of his mysteries. Look at what the Bible says about the angels who have known him for a long, 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 long time. And what do they do? They're sitting there in God's presence, watching what he does. And what do they do all the time? <gasps> holy, holy, holy! Every few seconds, because God is always doing something just that blows their mind. And they thought they knew him, and yet he's, he's loving a person as sinful as me, as sinful as you. And the angels say, wow, we never saw it like that. God can love sinners. We thought, and that was the problem, Satan thought that that couldn't happen. And that was where he went wrong down the wrong road. Because God always loves sinners. So we're going to sing our closing hymn.